Good evening. My name is David Leslie, and as the Executive Director of the Rothko Chapel, it's my privilege and real joy to welcome you here tonight for the Francis Tarleton Sissy Farenthold Endowed Lecture in Peace, Social Justice, and Human Rights. This is the eighth lecture in partnership with the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. In recognition of Sissy's leadership, both here at the chapel and at the center and at the law school, we alternate the lecture between here at the chapel in Houston and at the university in Austin. While last year's lecture was held at the University of Texas seven months after Sissy's passing and featured a dynamic and evocative presentation by noted Indian writer and activist Arundhati Roy, this is the first Sissy lecture held in the chapel since her death on September 26, 2021. Now, while no longer with us physically, Sissy's presence and memory are deeply ingrained in this sacred space, as she served at one time as the chair of the board of directors and was our conscience in chief, reminding us constantly of our responsibility to do all that we can do to promote peace and further equity and justice, both individually and collectively. Now, as this is a joint lecture, and Sissy's lasting legacy is not only here, but also, I'm trying to fight the right word, Karen, uh, infused, embedded, ever present at the UT Law School. It's my pleasure to introduce my good friend and the visionary force behind the lecture, Karen Engel. Karen is the Minerva House Drysdale Regents Chair in Law at the University of Texas School of Law and founder and co-director of the Rappaport Center, who will now share a bit more information about the Farenthold Lecture and the genesis of the relationship with Sissy. Karen, welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much, David. Um, it's once again a pleasure to present this program with the Rothko Chapel, and it's terrific to be here in person. Um, I know there are people who are watching uh, virtually as well, but it's really nice to be here. I'm very grateful to you and to Kelly Johnson and the entire Rothko Chapel staff for coordinating and producing this year's lecture. And I'm appreciative of the many friends and family members of Sissy Farenthold, a number of whom are with us tonight, who had the foresight to establish and continue to support this lecture. On behalf of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice, and we have assembled, um, we have quite a number of people who came from Austin tonight, uh, including from our new Sissy Farenthold Reproductive Justice Defense Resource Project. I'm delighted to join in welcoming you all here in the chapel, as well as those who are joining us virtually. The event this evening features one of the most prominent thinkers in the country on race, reproduction, regulation of the family, and multiple forms of abolition, and that's Professor Dorothy Roberts. She will bring many of those issues together in her lecture tonight, on, quote, the long struggle to abolish reproductive slavery. Now, David will give Dorothy and our moderator, Eleanor Kilbanoff, a proper introduction, but I want to welcome you both and say what an honor it is to share the stage with you this evening. And Dorothy, on a personal note, I want to say how fortunate I feel to have actually met you relatively early in our academic career, what, four or five years ago? Uh, don't laugh. Um, and have had the chance to follow your work, if too often from a distance over the past 30 years. Um, David asked me to say a word about the lecture, which of course means talking about Sissy Farenthold. Now those of you who knew Sissy, or know of her, know that she had a relatively short-lived but highly impactful role as a Texas politician, and that she was a lifelong local and global grassroots activist. 
That inspires the purpose of the lecture series. And I'll read to you what we say about the lecture series. So, in line with the mission of both the Rothko Chapel and the Rappaport Center, and with Sissy's own history of exposing and responding to injustices and inequality as both a public servant and a global citizen, the lecture series brings internationally renowned scholars and activists who will inspire their audiences to think and act creatively to respond to some of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. And the challenges keep growing. As David noted, Sissy was long central both to the Rappaport Center and the Rothko Chapel, as well as to this annual lecture series. So as part of her role as conscience in chief, she always played a consultative part in choosing our lecturer. She did so this year as well, if indirectly, as we did our best to conjure up her input in our selection of Dorothy Roberts. I feel confident that Sissy would be enormously pleased. And to show why, I've decided to focus on a few aspects of Sissy's biography that bear on tonight's themes. So Sissy graduated from the University of Texas School of Law in 1949, but before she became a public figure in the 1970s, she served as director of Nueces County Legal Aid in her hometown of Corpus Christi, Texas. Sissy always credited that experience as a legal aid lawyer with shaping the political values that drove her first campaign, economic protections for poor women and children, and civil rights, particularly for Mexican Americans and African Americans. And although once she was elected, she went on to address and work on many issues from disarmament to nuclear disarmament to corruption in Texas government, Sissy never wavered from her commitment to economic, social, and political empowerment and justice for racialized minorities. And I'm just gonna give you two quick examples for the purposes of tonight's lecture. First, Sissy is perhaps best known for her unapologetically progressive campaign in 1972 to become governor of Texas, which she nearly achieved. Some attribute her loss in the runoff to her call for the abolition of the Texas Rangers, which she called a quote, festering sore for the damage they wrought especially to Mexican Americans in South Texas. Now abolishing the police, much less the Texas Rangers, was on few people's mind at the time. And those were definitely fighting words. As Calvin Trillin wrote in the day, the only thing she could have done to alienate some voters more was, quote, to launch a vitriolic personal attack on John Wayne. Second, Sissy became the first chair of the National Women's Political Caucus in 1973. And in 1977, she gave a speech to the national membership on abortion. She said, quote, I come to you today with as great a sense of grievance and injustice as of indignation, and with anguish as well as anger over the recent course of events as regards, regards the constitutional right to abortion, end quote. Sissy's words are an important reminder of how Roe v. Wade was already undermined in 1977 by all three branches of the government who had essentially excluded poor people from access to abortion. Now these words from 45 years ago are unfortunately apt today in the wake of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, which overturned even the inadequately realized rights guaranteed by Roe. Sissy foresaw that the battle for reproductive justice for all would be a long one, and also saw its important connections to race, class, and sexuality struggles. So that makes it especially important that Sissy allowed us to create this lecture in her honor, as it provides a means for us to continue to strategize about how best to combat these broad range of injustices that are so deeply interconnected. And it was with all that in mind that we, and with Sissy and Spirit, selected Dorothy Roberts as our lecturer. So I'll now turn it over to David for the official introduction of Dorothy and Eleanor. Thank you all again.
Now, before I introduce tonight's speaker and moderator, I want to express our collective gratitude to the many individuals and institutional supporters for this, year, uh, this year's lecture, including the Jacob and Therese Hershey Foundation for its gener generous uh, underwriting support. And tonight we have in the house, I see Elizabeth Love, the director. Uh, thank you all so much for not only your support for the lecture, but for your leadership in the uh, media community and the broader state and world. Thank you so much for that. I also special, really special thanks to the uh, Texas Tribune for uh, supporting this year's lecture as the media sponsor. First time we've had that sponsorship. It's great, it really helped us to get the word out statewide, if not beyond the borders of Texas. And UT Health Houston School of Public Health for their support as a community partner. So can we give them a big, uh, big sign of appreciation? I'm gonna echo uh, uh, what Karen said because it's uh, been a great, great team effort to, to develop the uh, lecture. So I do want to lift up uh, the Rappaport Center co-director, Neville Hode, who's sitting down here on the front row, along with his colleague, uh, Carolyn Hine, Han, and then all of the Rappaport uh, fellows and students that are involved. And then I also want to lift up my colleague, Kelly Johnson, who's the director of our public program, and Anna Martinez, the program and volunteer coordinator, and all the staff and volunteers who are here tonight that make it uh, such a warm, hospitable, uh, supportive place. Let me tell you, we could not do it without their leadership and support. So let's give them all a big round of applause. Okay, I'm almost finished with the business stuff, but there are two important housekeeping notes. One, if you would please silence your phones and no videos. We will be, we are videotaping tonight's lecture and it will be on both the uh, Chapel website and the Rappaport Center website in the very near future. Uh, the second, if you're in person, when you got your program, there's a card, an index card, that's used for questions. So if you have a question uh, that you'd like to bring up during that part of the program, write it on your card and then hold it up and a volunteer or staff member will come to pick it up. And if you're watching it online, virtually, uh, there is a chat box and you can put your question in the chat box. That'll be collected and then brought to our moderator tonight. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can. So with all that behind us, now let's move to the introduction to tonight's uh, speaker and the lecture. As many of you in this room are well aware, civil and human rights should never be taken for granted, nor soon to be universally applied. As a Rothko Chapel acknowledged last year when our board was discussing uh, what was about to happen at the Supreme Court, we issued a statement that said, during most of the chapel's existence, Women's rights in the United States have been enhanced due in part to Roe v. Wade, which protected the right of women to make fundamental decisions about their reproductive health. The decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization to roll back these protections is a violation of a basic human right that strips away the liberty of women to govern their own bodies. In Texas, as well as many other states in this union, when it comes to the full range of issues related to reproductive justice, it often seems like every aspect of individual and human autonomy is under attack. A reality that should be concerning to all of us, regardless of our personal feelings about abortion, gender affirmative sur surgery, restroom of choice, sports, or childbirth. The politicization of these issues is not new. However, there is a growing and dehumanizing level of vitriol and violence that make dialogue difficult and compassion seemingly elusive. As such, what we are facing in this country is not just a political or a public safety crisis, but a spiritual existential catastrophe where a person's worth, meaning, and very existence is called into question. So then, with that as backdrop of reality, how do we navigate these troubled waters? How do we understand the genesis of the problems before us? What individual and collective actions can we take to reverse the current trends related to reproductive injustice and the stripping away of other civil rights that impact so many people in this country? 
to help us delve into these and other problems and their companion solutions to the challenges we face, we are very fortunate, as Karen noted, to have Dorothy Roberts with us here in the house this evening, whose work addresses many of the urgent social issues of the day. Professor Roberts is a Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor at the University of Pennsylvania and is the George A. Weiss Professor of Law and Sociology, the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tur Tanner Marcel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights and Professor of Africana Studies. She is also the founding director of the program on race, science, and society with appointments in Penn Carey Law and the School of Arts and Sciences. Roberts works at the intersection of law, social justice, science, and health. And if that is not enough, when in her spare time, outside of the academic arena, she has also served as the chair of the board of directors of the Black Women's Health Initiative and currently serves on the board of directors of the National Coalition for Child Protection Reform and the advisory board of the Center for Genetics and Society. She's received many awards She's well published, and I want to just lift a couple of her books up that uh, if you haven't read, you should. Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, published by Pantheon in 1997. Fatal uh, Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, published by New Press in 2011. And a recent book, Torn Apart, how the child welfare system destroys black families and how abolition can build a safer world, recently published by Basic Books in 2022. Professor Roberts, we're just so grateful to have you in the house and uh, we'll be with you in just one second. Joining uh, at our moderated conversation this evening uh, will be uh, Eleanor Kibanoff, who will engage in conversation, incorporate your questions into this evening's program. Ms. Kibanoff is the women's health reporter at the Texas Tribune and was previously with the Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting, where she covers sexual assault, domestic violence, and policing, among other important social issues. She's worked at public, state, public radio stations in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Missouri, as well as NPR, and her work has aired on All Things Considered, Morning Edition, and Here and Now. So we've got two really, really uh, committed and engaged individuals to help us uh, delve into the issues that have been laid out this evening. So with that, my part is done. Let us give a warm, warm welcome to Professor Dorothy Roberts as she comes to the dais. Thank you so much for those introductions, Karen and David. Uh, yes, I think it's closer to 40 years than four years, Karen, that we have been engaging with each other in academia. I'm just so extremely honored to give the Sissy Farenthal Lecture, uh, and even more honored after hearing uh, Karen's remarks about her and the parallels uh, between our work. I regret that I wasn't able to meet her. Uh, I'm especially thrilled that the lecture is taking place in the Rothko Chapel, uh, not to downplay UT <laughs> Austin uh, Law School, but uh, there's just something special about this place, as you can all see. I had a chance to visit here uh, without the crowd yesterday, and it really is a place that promotes peace and contemplation. And uh, I feel liberated to show a little bit more of my spiritual side because of that, something that uh, is hard to do in the academic settings I usually speak in. Uh, I'm also just so touched and moved that this is a lecture in Sissy Fernholt's name dedicated to peace and social justice and human rights. And I 
want to thank everyone who helped to bring it together. David Leslie, Karen Engel, uh, Kelly, where's Kelly? Uh, Kelly and Anna, and I'm not sure where everybody is, but all the people at the Rothko Chapel and all the staff. I haven't met all of you, but everyone also at the Rappaport Center. Uh, and then the other co-organizers as well. I'm so grateful for that teamwork that brought the lecture together. So uh, in this lecture, I want to draw our attention to one of the longest freedom struggles in the United States. Of course, it's a struggle that's global, but I'm going to focus on the United States, and that's the struggle to abolish reproductive slavery. The full history and scope of the struggle for reproductive freedom are typically downplayed, and its ties to other abolitionist struggles are often ignored. I think that that has a lot to do with devaluing the women who have been at the center of both reproductive slavery and the struggle to abolish it, black women. Those are the people who've been the center of my scholarship from the very beginning, from my very first law review article to the, my latest book, Torn Apart. And I want to draw together my work over the last three decades, spotlighting the devaluation of black women's childbearing, the criminalization of pregnancy, and my most recent scholarship on and activism on compelled family separation. After the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs, we can see more clearly a right-wing strategy for reproductive control that includes not only abortion bans that compel people to give birth, but also a broader policing of being pregnant and raising children, all of which will carry an especially heavy toll on black women. It's therefore more urgent than ever that we attend to black women's longstanding struggle against reproductive slavery. So to do that, I think we have to start at the beginning of US history and the enslavement of African women. Exploitation of enslaved women's reproductive labor entailed enslavers' domination of both childbearing and child rearing. Because enslavers had a vital economic stake in black women's childbearing, they made control of reproduction a central aspect of the slavery regime. Enslavers claimed a property right in enslaved women's bodies and enslaved women's children from the moment of conception. In 1662, the Virginia Colonial Assembly had to decide the status of children born to black women and fathered by white men, men who raped enslaved women with impunity. The colonists made the political decision to give the children the status of their mothers. Now, this, of course, violated the patriarchal law of human inheritance, which gave children the status of their fathers. Instead, they followed the law that applied to animals. Uh, pig, piglets, for example, are the property of whoever owns the sow. This radical break with kinship law had monumental impact on views about humanity. It permitted white men to profit from raping enslaved women by enslaving any resulting children. It allowed them to enslave their own children. How could they enslave their own children? By classifying them as belonging to a different race. It also cemented the myth that race is produced through reproduction and that black women reproduce the subordinated status of their children. You know, I've written about that law for a long time. I wrote about it in my very first Law Review article in 1991. And every time I think about it, I'm just awestruck 
by the magnitude of what that law did. I'm going to repeat it because I think it's hard to wrap your head around how it was so essential to not only reproductive slavery, but also the very meaning of race. It helped to invent race, it helped to invent the lie that human beings are naturally divided into different races. So it allowed white men to profit from rape by enslaving the children that resulted from it. It allowed them to enslave their own children by just classifying them as a different race. It, so it erased kinship ties. It erased even biological. It's more powerful than biology, more powerful than family ties. Racism is so powerful, it can erase biology while pretending that it's biological. And then it, I think, is the origin of this idea that race is reproduced, that it's a natural product of procreation, and at the same time, the message that black women's wombs are what create the disadvantage, the subordinated status of their children. I mean, just think about that. All of that is reverberating today. Two centuries later, in 1860, the Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner would point to this legal entanglement of sexual assault, reproductive control, and white supremacy as the chief reason to abolish slavery. He declared before Congress that, quote, the chastity of a whole race is exposed to violence, while the result is recorded in the telltale faces of children, glowing with the master's blood, but doomed for the mother's skin to slavery through descending generations. Captured all those aspects in that one sentence. Family separation was inextricably tied to reproductive servitude, one of the most awful atrocities inflicted by slavery was the physical separation of enslaved parents from their children. And slavers had absolute discretion to buy and sell family members separately from each other. They could dismember black families at will for whatever reason. A 19th century South Carolina court noted that planters could sell children away from their mothers no matter how young. Newborns could be taken and sold away because, quote, the young slaves stand in the same footing as other animals. According to historian, uh, my colleague at Penn, Heather Andrea Williams, approximately one third of enslaved children in the Upper South experience family separation. A slaveholder might sell a mother, a father, or their children to pay off a debt or to punish perceived disobedience. Black family members were devised in wills, wagered at horse races, and awarded in lawsuits. They were disbanded when the heirs of an estate decided not to continue the patriarch's business, or when enslaved children were hired or apprenticed out to work on another plantation. As Toni Morrison wrote in Beloved, enslaved women's loved ones routinely, quote, got rented out, loaned out, bought out, brought back, stored up, mortgaged, won, stolen or seized. Nobody stopped playing checkers just because the pieces included your children. Even when enslaved families remained physically intact, black parents were denied authority over their children. Slavery law installed the white patriarch as the head of the extended plantation family. And that included black people whom he enslaved. White people considered the plantation family ruled by white men to be the best institution to teach values to Africans whom they deemed to be uncivilized. Uh, law professor Peggy Cooper Davis writes, abrogation of the parental bond was a hallmark of the civil death the United States slavery imposed. Now, black mothers resisted reproductive slavery. 
by self-inducing abortions, feigning illness, and fending off enslavers' sexual assaults. You may have read about the case of Celia, who was purchased in 1850 at age 14 by a white Missouri farmer named Robert Newsom, who bought her for the purpose of forcing sex on her. And he raped her on the way back from buying her uh, to his farm in Missouri. After enduring five years of hell and pregnant with another one of his children, she clubbed him twice over the head, killing him. The judge in her murder trial instructed the jury that the law of self-defense didn't apply to chattel property. <laughs> Celia was found guilty and hanged in 1855. In rare cases, as Toni Morrison fictionalized in Beloved, black women committed infanticide to protect their children from the horrors of slavery. But surely, enslaved women's greatest act of resistance was caring for their children. Yet their love for their children gave enslavers a cruel advantage. Slaveholders could threaten enslaved women who were rebellious with the sale of their children to make them more compliant. And slavers used children as hostages to prevent bonded women from running away or to turn, uh, uh, to, to lure escaped, uh, women who escaped back to the plantation. This strategy is one of the reasons far fewer women than men fled from bondage. Most enslaved women were unwilling to abandon their children in order to increase their own chances for escape. And most fugitive women took their children with them. So there's a long history of a white elite, on one hand, devaluing black mothers' relationships with their children, pretending that black women don't care about their children, while on the other hand, using the threat of child removal to control and punish black mothers because they do care for their children so much. And I'll have more to say about that later. The rights of family were central to the antebellum movement to abolish slavery. In petitions to the government, enslaved people often based their claims for freedom on the natural right to family integrity. Abolitionists also focused their condemnation of slavery on its immoral destruction of families, often called at the time the greatest perceived sin of American slavery. Images of crying mothers and children clinging to each other as merciless slave traders wrenched them apart were widely circulated in anti-slavery pamphlets, slave narratives, and newspapers. The Reconstruction Congress was moved to draft the 13th and 14th Amendments, both by formerly enslaved people's heart-wrenching accounts of family separation and by the argument that the right to family integrity is inalienable. For example, Republican Senator James Harlan of Iowa advocated for the 13th Amendment by accusing slavery of causing, quote, the abolition practically of the parental relationship, robbing the offspring of the care and attention of his parents, severing a relation which is universally cited as the emblem of the relation sustained by the creator to the human family. His colleague, Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, promised accordingly, quote, when this amendment to the Constitution shall be consummated, the sharp cry of the agonizing hearts of severed families will cease to vex the weary ear of the nation. Just as contemporary reproductive servitude can chase, trace its roots to slavery, contemporary notions of family liberty can trace their roots to black people's resistance against this form of state violence. But the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments didn't end reproductive slavery or the struggle against it. 
we can fill out the trajectory of the foundational exploitation of enslaved women's reproductive labor with the history of policies punishing black women's childbearing throughout the 20th century. Black women's historical experiences of reproductive violation help to illuminate the intersection of laws that compel pregnancy and laws that criminalize pregnancy loss. As I stated earlier, the first laws enacted in the colonies treated black women as innately unrapeable and their children as innately enslavable. This laid the foundation for long-lasting notions of black women's hypersexuality and hyperfertility and policies aimed at deterring black women from having children. The belief that black women passed down a depraved lifestyle to their children persisted even after the passage of the civil rights laws through the circulation of popular icons of black maternal unfitness, such as the welfare queen, who was portrayed as having babies just to get a welfare check and then spending all the money on herself while neglecting her children, or the image of the uh, crack addict who gave birth to the supposedly monstrous crack baby. These stereotypes were buttressed by racist scientific research, such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan's 1965 report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, that blamed black matriarchs for the impoverishment of black ghettos. This mythology fueled harsh welfare and law enforcement policies including mass sterilization of black women receiving welfare through federally funded social service programs. And these myths and policies developing black women's childbearing are the subject of my 1997 book, Killing the Black Body. Of particular significance is the prosecution of black women for being pregnant and using drugs launched during the war on crack in the late 1980s. Stoked by these false depictions of pregnant crack addicts and so-called crack babies as irredeemable monsters, the devaluation of black women's procreation turned a public health issue into a crime. Over the ensuing decades, the fetal personhood movement developed a unified legal strategy of criminalizing pregnancy while shutting down access to abortion services. Legal theories crafted to prosecute black women set the stage for more widespread criminalization for fetal harm. So by 2020, more than 1,700 women were arrested, detained, or subjected to forced medical interventions because of pregnancy-related outcomes and accusations. Over the same period, state legislatures enacted fetal protection laws that criminalized pregnancy by giving fetuses the status of already born children. As states mounted legislative assaults on access to abortion, they also constructed a legal apparatus to charge pregnant people criminally for putting their fetuses at risk, including charging them for pregnancy losses. Beginning with the 2001 homicide conviction of a black woman in Mississippi named Regina McKnight, who spent eight years in prison until her conviction was overturned, for a stillbirth. Women have been arrested both for stillbirths and for attempted abortions under the same fetal protection laws. By eliminating Roe's protection of abortion before viability, which some states considered at least a limitation on fetal abuse prosecutions, Dobbs has unleashed state power to criminalize pregnant people who fail to deliver a healthy baby. The contemporary parallels to black women's reproductive servitude during slavery don't end with police and pregnancy. They continue with forced family separation. 
Many Americans view the child welfare system as a benign social service provider that safeguards children from abuse and neglect in their homes. But as I explain in my latest book, Torn Apart, this government regime is better described as a family policing system. It's a powerful state apparatus that intensively regulates the most marginalized communities in this nation by accusing family caregivers of child maltreatment, investigating and monitoring them, placing their children in the foster system, and permanently severing their familial bonds. Child protection agents gain their power to regulate families by wielding the threat of taking away their children. In 2020 alone, child protection agencies investigated accusations of maltreatment involving three million children. In cities across the nation, CPS, or Child Protective Services, surveillance is concentrated in impoverished black neighborhoods where all parents, all children, are ruled by the agency's threatening presence. Most black children in America, 53%, will experience a CPS investigation at some point before they reach age 18. Okay. Most black children in America will experience an investigation for child maltreatment before they reach age 18. And in some counties, it's even higher. During CPS investigations, caseworkers typically inspect every corner of the home and typically without any judicial warrant. The Fourth Amendment has basically been uh, exempted. Uh, they've been exempted from the Fourth Amendment even though it applies to them. And they interrogate family members about intimate details of their lives. They may strip search children to look for evidence and collect confidential information from schools, healthcare providers, and social service programs. More disruptive still is the forcible family separation that too often follows CPS investigations. Most of the more than $30 billion spent on child welfare services goes to keeping children away from their families in foster care and adoption assistance rather than prevention and family services. More than one in 10 black children will be taken from their families by their 18th birthday. Most children in foster care were removed from their homes based on accusations of parental neglect, which is defined as failing to supply, quote, the proper or necessary support for a child's well-being. And obviously, that is easily confused with poverty. Based on state child neglect laws, child protection investigators interpret conditions of poverty, such as lack of food, insecure housing, and inadequate medical care education as evidence of parental unfitness. And what's the remedy they provide? State agents force families into an onerous regimen of supervision that rarely addresses their needs. Parents who are unable to complete agency requirements in order to recover their children from foster care within an imposed time frame face termination of their rights. A judge permanently severs their legal relationship with their children. The struggle to abolish reproductive slavery also continues in the battle over abortion. Although there are obvious distinctions between exploiting the reproductive labor of enslaved women and banning abortion, there is also a profound resemblance in the denial of autonomy caused by compelled pregnancy in both cases. I think we should consider the violence inflicted on black women by compelling their pregnancies under slavery to elucidate the violence inflicted on pregnant people today by compelling them to give birth under abortion bans. And slavers' legal control over black women's reproductive capacity 
and the law's failure to give enslaved women any legal right to bodily autonomy cast an archetype for laws that compel pregnant people to give birth. As historian Jennifer Morgan asked, where is the precedent for the appropriation of a person's body by the state? Where did we learn in this country that the state could define a fetus as a distinct matter of law and property and state intervention? We learned that from the long and violent history of hereditary racial slavery. Enslaved women's resistance against reproductive servitude also proves the Supreme Court's error in Dobbs. The Dobbs Court grossly misread the 14th Amendment and ignored its history by holding it provided no support for reproductive freedom. And as I already said, that was the reason, a central reason, for enacting the 13th and 14th Amendments to abolish reproductive slavery. Apparently, the court was unaware of that history. And to the contrary, the Dobbs decision will intensify the denial of family autonomy and destruction of family bonds that the Reconstruction Amendments were meant to eradicate. Especially telling is how the court's attention to adoption ties together the forms of reproductive oppression that are rooted in slavery, both compel pregnancy and force family separation. Anti-abortion advocates have long held out adoption as a remedy for the harms of compelling pregnant people to give birth. They argue that the availability of adoption eliminates a pregnant person's obligation to raise unwanted children and therefore serves as a substitute for having an abortion. By linking abortion to adoption, conservatives hope to make abortion restrictions seem less onerous, thereby garnering popular support for them. But liberals, too, have embraced adoption as a seemingly uncontroversial child welfare policy that can build common ground with conservatives on the hot button issue of abortion. The adoption remedy became a significant aspect of the Dobbs decision. Some anti-abortion activists who gathered outside the Supreme Court during the oral argument carried signs with the message, I will adopt your baby. And during Julie Rickleman's argument on behalf of abortion clinics, Justice Amy Coney Barrett suggested that the burdens experienced by pregnant people who are denied abortions could easily be relieved by relinquishing their babies. Here's what she said, uh, how she uh, questioned Julie Rickleman during the argument. Quote, insofar as you and many of you, your amici, focus on the ways in which forced parenting, forced motherhood, would hinder women's access to the workplace and to equal opportunities. It's also focused on the consequences of parenting and the obligations of motherhood that flow from pregnancy. Why don't the safe haven laws take care of that problem? Now, Justice Alito picked up this idea in his majority opinion. It didn't stay at the questioning uh, during the oral argument. He recited without any criticism anti-abortion advocates' argument, quote, that states have increasingly adopted safe haven laws which generally allow women to drop off babies anonymously and that a woman who puts her newborn up for adoption today has little reason to fear that the baby will not find a suitable home. That's a quote from the Dobbs decision. Okay, he then backed up this false claim with a footnote that quoted a 2008 CDC report. Quote, nearly one million women were seeking to adopt in 2002, i.e. they were in demand for a child whereas the domestic supply of infants, the dom this is a quote from the opinion, footnote, the domestic supply of infants relinquished at birth or within the first month of life and available to be adopted 
had become virtually non-existent. The court is suggesting that forcing pregnant people to give birth created a win-win situation. By surrendering their babies for adoption, pregnant people would escape the burdens of, of parenting while meeting the unfilled demand for adoptable babies. This vision of a well-functioning market for babies could not be further from the truth. First of all, it conveniently omits the physical and mental costs of gestating a fetus and the ethical problem of overriding pregnant people's autonomy over their bodies. The adoption market imagery falsely treats the decision to surrender the baby as if it were a freely made reproductive choice, when in reality it was coerced by the inability to get an abortion. But there's more, there's more that's so false about this baby market imagery. It terribly mischaracterizes how the adoption system operates. Justice Alito's portrayal of the transfer of babies from birth mothers to adoptive couples as an equitable transaction masks the coercive power arrangements that underlie the transfers. To begin with, pressuring people to relinquish their babies for adoption typically takes a profound emotional toll. The pain of losing a newborn is so severe that people who are denied an abortion rarely surrender their babies for adoption. Uh, when they were surrendered more readily or more often prior to Roe v. Wade, it was because they were forced to do it. You know, pregnant uh, teenage girls, for example, they were shipped off. It wasn't because they freely surrendered their babies for adoption. Instead, compelling people to give birth to a child whom they are economically, socially, or psychologically unprepared to raise intensifies the hardships faced by them and their families. I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that adoption, I'm sorry, abortion or adoption is a solution for economic insecurity. I am saying that compelling people to give birth to children they knew they weren't prepared economically to take care of increases the economic stress that they're under. The Turnaway study, which tracked 1,000 women who sought abortions over 10 years, found that the women who were denied abortion care suffered serious physical, emotional, and economic harm. They were far more likely to be living in poverty, undergo evictions and bankruptcies, and experience mental health problems than their counterparts who had abortions. The hardships abortion bans impose on people to keep, who keep their babies create an avenue for forced family separation, and this is how it ties together this other aspect of reproductive slavery I have been talking about. Forcing people to give birth to children they are unprepared to care for will increase their odds of being deemed neglectful and becoming entangled in the family policing system. And let's remember, adoption of children from foster care requires the termination of their parents' rights. Far from being a free market transaction, as the Dobbs Court implied, the availability of children in the foster system for adoption results from a system that relies on coercion, threats, and terror. The justice's promotion of adoption also ignores the untold number of what have been called legal orphans in the foster system, children who were legally severed from their families but were never adopted. Many of these children age out of the foster system, abandoned, abandoned by the state at age 18 or 21. And obviously, they're vulnerable to houselessness, poverty, and incarceration. 
Denying access to abortion will increase the numbers of children consigned to and spit out of the foster system without any family ties at all. So just as criminalizing abortion will increase the number of children forcibly removed from their homes, so criminalizing fetal abuse will expand the grounds for family separation. Being pregnant and using drugs is already seen as evidence of parental unfitness. Hospital staff routinely screen certain newborns for evidence of their mother's drug use during pregnancy and report positive results to child protection authorities. Over the last 30 years, states have increasingly included prenatal drug use in their definitions of child maltreatment. Now, most states don't have either universal drug testing or clear testing rules, nor do they have any checks on when to report positive tests to police or child protection authorities. And this free-for-all invites rampant discrimination against black mothers by hospital staff. So compelling pregnant people to give birth will increase state removals of children from parents charged with neglecting them either in the womb or after they are born. Black women's experiences of reproductive servitude and family separation illuminate the fallacy of the Dobbs Court's appeal to adoption as a benevolent alternative to abortion. The heart of the fallacy is its support for a foundational carceral logic that structures policy systems and institutions in America. The rhetoric of saving babies is a guise to justify expanding the government's power to regulate individuals, families, and communities, even beyond what is currently permitted by the criminal legal system. The veneer of benevolence obscures how these integrated reproductive violations support racial capitalism, the US system of wealth accumulation grounded in racist hierarchy and ideology. They all impose offenses, I'm sorry, they all impose a punitive, a punitive approach to meeting families' material needs that takes the place of needed social change. I'm skipping ahead because I know I'm running out of time and I want to get to our, my discussion and conversation and Q&A. We can see the relationship between racism, poverty, and reproductive slavery and the geography of abortion bans. The states that enacted the most severe restrictions on abortion are the very ones with the highest child poverty rates, the worst healthcare systems, and the fewest supports for struggling families. These same states have the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the nation, rates that are far worse for black people. Put differently, the states that compel pregnant people to give birth are the very ones that are the riskiest, the deadliest, for black people to be pregnant. Dobbs envisions a society where adoption is forced upon politically marginalized people as a response to crises caused by racial capitalism and structural inequities. Malcolm X said, and this is one of my favorite of many quotes by Malcolm X, I have no mercy or compassion in me for a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. That is precisely what this society does through its policies of reproductive slavery. We should have no mercy for such a regime, and we should have endless compassion for the people it crushes and punishes. That leads me, more than anything, 
to join the continuing abolitionist struggle against reproductive slavery. Black feminists have long argued that reproductive freedom includes both bodily and family autonomy. We have developed a reproductive justice analysis that accounts for the entanglement of abortion bans, criminalization of pregnancy, and forcible child removal. The human right not to have a child, to have a child, and to raise a child in safe, supportive, sustainable communities has always been, for the very beginning, chief tenets of the reproductive justice framework. And it's a framework that is made more urgent than ever by Dobbs. Rather than center on defending legal protections for the most privileged people, the reproductive justice movement centers on creating a society that meets human needs without policing pregnancy and families. Abolition isn't just about tearing down oppressive systems. W.E.B. Du Bois attributed the defeat of freedom despite emancipation and the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments to the failure to create what he called an abolition democracy. True freedom required not only the end to chattel slavery, but also the simultaneous building up of a free society for everyone. An essential part of prison abolitionist theory is that eliminating prisons must occur alongside creating a society that has no need for them. Prisons will only cease when social, economic, and political conditions eliminate the need for them. Abolitionists are working toward a society where prisons are inconceivable. So how do we envision a society that is more peaceful, just, and humane while focusing on the problems of today? Or to put it in reverse, how do we deal with the world as it is now while also working toward the world we want it to be? Or to put it in more existential terms, which standing in the Rothko Chapel, as I said, makes me feel liberated to uh, raise more existential questions. How do we live on earth while reaching for heaven? For me, that is the central question of my faith, but I suspect it cuts across many spiritual decisions. The spiritual center of the Christian faith, Jesus, taught that our hope for eternal life in heaven had to shape how we loved people on earth. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus identifies who will be blessed in heaven. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The righteous people listening to him were confused about when they did all those things for him. And Jesus replied that it's whatever they did for the least among us on earth that counts. Enslaved women had to imagine a future where slavery didn't exist in order to strive toward freedom in the here and now. Abolishing slavery meant believing in a radically different future and working toward it even while still in chains. In the words of a great abolitionist visionary, Angela Davis, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time, right now, right now. But how can abolitionists take incremental steps toward dismantling carceral systems while fa fa without falling into reformist traps? F another visionary abolitionist, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, resolved this quandary with the concept of non-reformist reforms. 
To be abolitionist reforms must shrink rather than strengthen the state's capacity for violence and facilitate the work of building a reimagined society. By engaging in non-reformist reforms, we can strive to make transformative changes in carceral systems with the objective of demolishing these systems rather than fixing them. And we can unite the movements for reproductive justice, for prison industrial complex abolition, for abolition of the family policing system under the banner of a shared vision of a caring and free society rather than a carceral society. We should connect activism to guarantee the legal right to abortion and all that's needed to actually be free from compelled pregnancy to the growing movement to dismantle family policing, led by parents and youth who have been ensnared in it. These activists promote legislation to end mandated reporting, to guarantee legal representation for parents, and to require informed consent for drug testing of pregnant people and their newborns. They advocate for policies that shift government funds away from coercive interventions in families toward putting resources directly in family caregivers' hands. And they are creating community-based approaches to support families and keep children safe. With a common radical vision for meeting human needs and caring for each other as equal human beings, we can build a society where all aspects of reproductive slavery, compelled pregnancies, compelling people to give birth, punishing people for pregnancy outcomes, and forcing people to surrender their children, all this would be unimaginable as a way of meeting human needs. That abolitionist vision, that mission, is as urgent right now as it ever has been. And I urge you all to join, and thank you so much for your attention. Give another round of applause. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yes, as was introduced, I'm Eleanor Klibanoff. I'm the women's health reporter at the Texas Tribune, um, and uh, thrilled to be here today talking Thank with you. Thank you. Thanks um, so much. Oh, also absolutely. For yes. Joining. Thank yeah. you. I had about a thousand questions before you started talking, and now uh, <laughs> just as many. So, um, and we are eager to hear all of your questions. So if you write them on the slip of paper and hold them up, we'll get them brought in the mix, and we'll all get out of here by dawn. I <laughs> So yes, uh, you know, I want to start by sort of asking you for, as you talked about, you know, for 40 years you've been writing and talking about these issues of reproductive justice and family policing and, um, you know, pregnancy criminalization, all these things that are now sort of in the mainstream conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think New York Magazine uh, had the headline, Dorothy Roberts tried to warn us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what has the last year been like for you to see these issues now in the conversation? Yeah, it's, it's both disturbing that uh, I and many others have been writing and advocating and organizing around, for example, criminalization of pregnancy. I mean, that, that was what inspired me to write Killing the Black Body to write my first law review article was on the prosecution of black women who are pregnant and using drugs, published in 1991, and writing about how that was connected to the criminalization of abortion and the lack of a real freedom uh, for uh, autonomy over our bodies. And uh, it, 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 it's been a struggle to get even the mainstream reproductive rights organizations to take up this more holistic view 
of uh, reproductive slavery and reproductive resistance. And so it's, it's been frustrating. I could also add, you know, I wrote a book called Shattered Bonds over 20 years ago about racism and the child welfare system and had in that book that it should be abolished, the system right. should be abolished. Uh, and also uh, not seeing very much attention to it. So in one sense, it's frustrating to work so hard. And again, it's not just me, others uh, working as well without much media attention, without, uh, if, if there's attention, it, it often uh, skews what the issues are to end up with a punitive approach to, to them. Uh, but on the other hand, it's been so thrilling to see in the last, even in the last two years, uh, you know, I often say I've seen more happen toward abolishing these systems and toward true reproductive freedom and understanding the meaning of reproductive justice and uh, organizing around it uh, in the last couple years than I saw in the preceding 20 years. So, and that, that's both the recognition of how criminalizing pregnancy broadly is under, uh, is happening, and how this broader notion of our reproductive freedom is under attack. You know, that it, the, the connection between banning abortion and punishing reproductive uh, uh, pregnancy outcomes and how they're, they're, it's the same policies, you know, the fetal protection policies are the same ones in either case, whether you're planning to give birth or you want to terminate your pregnancy. That overall policing is, is fomented and, and being supported by these, these same kinds of ideologies. So uh, I think people are more aware of that. Dobbs, I think, has made it very clear, uh, hopefully clear to people, that these connections are taking place and that we need uh, a reproductive justice movement that is broader than just the legal protection for abortion. Uh, so that's inspiring. And then also the growing movement against family separation, against family policing, uh, that has uh, taken off in the last few years is very, very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see, I mean, in states like Texas, where we have a very conservative legislature, a very conservative sort of political apparatus mm -hmm. at work, do you see a path for reproductive justice to be realized? I mean, I understand the urgency of the call to action, but yeah. Is, yeah. is that realistic? Yes, it has to be. <laughs> well, it depends on what the word realistic sure. and what the time frame is. But okay. um, I think, yes, it is realistic. I think we have to believe that we can win against the forces that, uh, of reproductive slavery that I've been talking about. And uh, the question is, what are our strategies? How can we organize? broadly in order to have enough political power to make these changes. So, and you know, what their various avenues, it's, the legislature can change, you know, it doesn't have to stay the same. Uh, it's harder to change the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, but we have other avenues besides relying on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with the entire makeup of the uh, courts in Texas, but uh, state courts have ruled in ways that are much more progressive and freedom enhancing than uh, the US Supreme Court. I mean, it's almost hard to imagine a court that isn't more uh, <laughs> freedom um, protecting than the US Supreme Court. And there's also, uh, community organizing, uh, I think we have to think about ways outside these legal systems like courts and uh, legislatures for how communities can come together to support each other, to figure out ways of uh, what, you know, whatever we're talking about in terms of enhancing our, and protecting our freedoms, like, you know, to change the 
way in which we relate to each other to provide resources for people, whether that means resources for impoverished families that are struggling to take care of children, there are ways in which you know, mutual aid and community networks can come together to provide for children, to support family caregivers. Uh, there are also ways in which we can figure out how to get people who need abortion services to places where they can get them. Uh, there's, you know, there are ways in which we don't have to rely on the traditional legal avenues to care for each other. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to think more and more about how to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that you know was in the book Torn Apart, which you haven't, if you haven't read, highly recommend. Um, that really resonated with me is you talked a lot about this idea of these foster care panics and sort yes. of child welfare panics. Yeah. Which is sort of this idea of, and I think we've seen them in Texas and everywhere. You know, a child dies a horrific death that CPS yeah. should have caught and. Right. The answer is more child welfare, more CPS workers. Um, it feels a little bit like this Dobbs case and the overturn of Roe v. Wade. It feels like sort of just a mass foster care panic in a way. It feels like yeah. that's the answer everyone is rushing towards. Yes, that's that's true. So it's it's so interesting, uh, disturbing, uh, flabbergasting how when a child is killed at home who was known to the system, and this is usually when child protection agencies get any attention from the press. That's changing, but for a long time, the only time you heard anything about the family policing system or the child welfare system or child protective services was when they knew about a family and a child was killed in the home. And instead of the response being, okay, obviously this system doesn't work to protect children, the response is, oh, we have to build up this system, put more resources into it, investigate more families. And all that does then is increase caseworkers' caseloads, and they're less able to, uh, to pay attention to the families who are in severe need. That, the best way to address it, as I was alluding to in my talk is to make sure that families have what they need to take care of children. And in almost every case where children are taken from their homes or where they, families are struggling, it has to do with not having the material concrete resources that they need. Uh, the, you know, the child welfare system doesn't pay much attention to wealthy families at all. It's, it was built to interfere in the most marginalized families as a substitute for actually the, that radical social change we need to not have marginalized families. And so it doesn't pay any attention to virtually, to wealthy white families because they can fend for themselves. They have the resources to deal with problems that do occur in those families. You know, children do have needs in those families as well. They even have unmet needs in those families. They have problems. But this is not a system that was created to deal with that. And so uh, the, what we have to do is radically change our approach to child welfare altogether to have a society where children's needs are met uh, and not punish families because they're unable to meet them. And so, yeah. <laughs> so, the, um, uh, so, so what, but getting back to your point about foster panic, so these panics that where legislatures then intensify, you know, the, expand the people who have to be mandated reporters, uh, put more money into it, be, be, you know, take more children away. Uh, that only makes children less safe. It doesn't increase 
their safety at all. This is actually, I, in Torn Apart, I mentioned a study that was done in Texas, mm -hmm. because Texas is very hard on families. It takes away a lot of children, and the researchers showed that that does not make children safer. Uh, in fact, they concluded that Texas would be better off spending more money giving families the concrete supports that they need. So, uh, these, yet these panics don't work to keep children safe. And I like your comparison to the panic uh, over what happens when you force people to give birth to children they're not prepared to take care of, where they have made the decision. They know for themselves, I'm not prepared for whatever reason, whatever reason, to uh, raise a child or another child, because of course most uh, people who have abortions have children, right? They are caring for children. They care about those children and they know they're not prepared. In many cases, this is always the reason, what, but to have another child. And the panic over what will happen to those children uh, you know, knowing that if you force people to have children, you're going to have babies who, in families that aren't prepared to take care of them, especially in a society that is geared toward punishing people who are unable to take care of their children, and to be extremely stingy. I left out of my lecture, I had a whole part of it where I was gonna you know, talk about the uh, welfare restructuring in the 1990s, the end of the federal guarantee to welfare, which was fueled largely by this myth of the black welfare queen, and its pairing with the Adoption and Safe Families Act that sped up termination of parental rights as a way to deal with the mushrooming foster population. And I, th those two coming together, 1996 and 1997, they really reflect this ideology in our nation that people should not get support to care for their children, and if they can't make it, then their children should be taken from them and their parental rights terminated. That's what those two laws together meant. Uh, they, they ended the federal guarantee of income supports for struggling families while at the same time continuing the requirement that states protect children from abuse and neglect, largely by taking their children away from them, and then added that the solution now, obviously that's gonna cause an even greater foster care population, the solution was to terminate their parents' rights and get them adopted. So every one of these is an example of this idea of the crisis the crisis around caregiving in America that is created by our grossly unequal and unjust economic system, racial capitalism, and the solution is to punish those people. It's exactly what, Mal this is why I love Malcolm X's quote, that it crushes people and then punishes them for not being able to bear the weight of the crushing burden of structural inequality. And that's the, that's the crisis. That's the crisis of capital, racial capitalism in America and, and our stingy approach, our cruel, unjust approach to caring for children and families. And the answer to the crisis are these punitive systems, put them in prison, take their children away, lock them up, terminate their parental rights. That's the answer that we're left with. You know, force them to give birth and then take their children from them. And in Texas, put them in a system, a foster care system that a federal judge has said, you know, children oh, leave more damage than they enter Absolutely, right. we know that. Right. Yes, yeah. well Texas, Texas, you know, yes, there's so many, right. I have so many examples of Texas yes, and torn Texas apart. Texas yeah, lends because itself to... It does, yeah. because I, I point out, in, I, I, I pointed to Texas when I make the point that 
we have tried to reform this system oh, yeah. for decades and decades. I, I myself have participated in reform efforts. After I wrote Shattered Bonds, I worked for nine years in a reform effort in Washington State out of a class action lawsuit like the one that Texas has been under for violating the constitutional rights of children in the foster system. And those nine years went by and the system is basically the same. And I point to the same thing in Texas where Texas has been under this consent decree to improve its foster system and the judge over and over again says, you're violating, you're violating it. You're still, you're still harming children in, foster, in the foster system. But the thing is that that's what fo the foster system does. It traumatizes children, it terrorizes families, it traumatizes children, it's structured to harm children. So, you know, many of us, and I see Alan Detlef here, the uh, co, founder of the Up End Movement and former dean at the University of Houston <laughs> Graduate College for social work. You know, we both have been working on this and I, I point to him because he's in Texas working on this. Um, and uh, it's, it's one, uh, but you know, we could point to right. every state, every state because it's not a matter of fixing this system, making it less harmful to children in the foster system. We have to abolish this system because it is structured to harm children and their families. It targets the most marginalized people. And, uh, tech, well, here's another example. This, the way it's used as a, to weaponize children against their parents. It, it weaponizes children in order to punish marginalized communities, which typically, historically, have been black and native communities. Mm -hmm. Those are the most likely to be torn apart by the system. But look at what Governor Abbott did to go after trans families with trans children. What did he, he use this weapon of child protective services and told caseworkers to start investigating families with trans kids who are uh, getting gender affirming care. And it lays wide open the ability of these families to be terrorized uh, because of the gender identity of the children. And it, that's just one of many examples of how this system can be used in order to target people who don't conform. It can be used as a weapon against rebellion. You know, it was the weapon of choice by the US military during the so-called Indian Wars, a military strategy to decimate native tribes by taking their children away and putting them initially in military camps and then that turned into the boarding school policy, the policy of adopting uh, native children, taking them from their homes on grounds of neglect and getting them adopted uh, by white families or put into white dominated orphanages. So, you know, there's so many examples after the, the civil rights gains. What did the South do in order to back, have a backlash against uh, school desegregation and other kinds of gains. They began to drop black mothers from the welfare roles, which they had just recently gained access to, and then start putting their children in foster care. And that there was a, a rule passed in the 1960s, federal rule, that if there wasn't a suitable home to receive welfare benefits, then it wasn't suitable for the children to stay there, and we start to see the skyrocketing of the foster population uh, into the 1990s, and then we see the backlash of the Adoption and Safe Families Act and, and re welfare restructuring. So uh, there's just so much historical evidence right. that uh, this system targets both to, uh, to, to punish, to control, to surveil, and to, uh, to 
uh, squelch rebellion, uh, much in the same way as I mentioned during the slavery era, how children could be weaponized against black mothers to keep them on plantations. Yeah. Uh, the same kind of strategies we see today. Right, right. And uh, no, absolutely. One of the, uh, Texas ranks 50th in the nation for direct cash assistance through TANF, the temporary assistance for needy families. Yeah, yes. I mean, one of the things you talk about in the book is this binary we have, the way we think is, you know, there are good parents and there are bad, pa and the bad parents are like pathologically yes. bad. Yes. But in fact, and, and the CPS workers are uniquely ill-equipped to give them what they actually need. I mean, we've uh, heard these exactly. stories again and again about, well, okay, how do I get safe housing? Well, I don't know, but it, that's it, not... Right, right. right. I, it, it, so most children who are taken from their families and put in foster care, the foster system, I hate using the word care because it's not sure. really a form of care, but they are taken on grounds of neglect, which, as I said, is simply failing to meet the needs of of children, the material needs of children. Some state statutes list those needs, you know, failure to provide secure housing, failure to provide adequate clothing, adequate food, adequate medical care. And uh, the caseworkers are not equipped to provide those things. What they, prov what they do is, well, first let me say, the underlying ideology of this is that the reason why parents are neglectful is because there, there's something wrong with their thinking. You know, they're pathological. They, they, so they need therapeutic remedies. Uh, so it's both that the child welfare agencies don't have the resources that families need. They're not set up that way. Uh, you know, our, our national approach to child welfare isn't set up to actually give families what they need to take care of children. And so the caseworkers don't have that. They don't have a house to provide, or insecure housing to provide to a family they find in a homeless shelter. You know, they, they don't have uh, the, uh, the clothing and food. I mean, maybe little, you know, temporary amounts of it, but not the sustained kind of nourishment and clothing and shelter and all of that that families need. So it's both that they're not equipped to do it, but also that's not what the approach is. The approach is we have to train these parents to take better care of their children. And so they're much more likely to be forced to go to parent training classes than to get uh, house, secure housing, for example. Right. And there's this uh, uh, therapeutic, psychological kind of approach which then obscures the structural reasons, the structural impediments to these families having the resources they need for children. And that's not to say that they may not have other kinds of issues they're dealing with. I mean, maybe there is a mental health problem. Maybe there is a substance use problem. Again, those problems exist in wealthy families too, and their children aren't taken from them. So the answer doesn't have to be to take children away. The same thing that a wealthy parent with a substance use disorder, and we know they exist. You know, just read the latest memoir right. of right. any you know child actor or uh, wealthy white person, and they are. No, they, they all talk about how terrible their parents were. What the one on the bestseller list is what, I'm glad my mo mom died or right. something like that? And right. she, right, you know, all, so we know that those problems exist, but they're not dealt with by separating the family. Right. And so uh, we, we have to completely, again, abolish this whole approach to struggling families of its, their fault because of some pathology, and the way to fix it is uh, a kind of therapeutic remedy. Right, so we are um, closing on time, but I do okay. want to get to this question, sure. because I think it could be a great place for us to, um, this is a question from a student here, okay. um, but if you want to take it even wider than that, is, okay. as students, how do we advocate for graduate coursework in reproductive <laughs> justice and black maternal health? But I'd love to know your thoughts on that from, you know, 
across school levels yes. and even, you know, people outside of academia? Yes, yes. So uh, I, I, that's a great question because I think, you know, as a, a teacher, a professor, I, especially one who has been teaching for, it's not quite 40 years yet, but almost, it's more than 30. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but probably near retirement in, you know, the foreseeable future. And uh, I look more and more to students to carry on this struggle. And students have been, in every issue I work on, including uh, the issue of uh, racism in medicine. Uh, students have been at the forefront, absolutely indispensable for these abolitionist movements. And it's going to be more and more important for students to be involved and to, uh, to have real power in making changes. And so uh, I think the, uh, the changing, radically changing curriculum in schools of social work, in medical schools, in law schools, it, you know, in, at the college level. You know, and as I say that, I realize that we're also up against this movement to, you know, to go backward, right, in uh, what uh, ch ch children are taught. But even in university, University of Florida, I have friends there who can't teach their, their courses because of what Governor DeSantis is requiring now. It's a, like a witch hunt for uh, people who teach about racism and sexism and other kinds of um, uh, social hierarchies. So, um, but in the face of that, it's all the more important uh, for students to continue to advocate for curricular change. And uh, I think the way to do that is, you know, stu you can as a student, you cannot do it on your own because you are in a disempowered position, uh, a very vulnerable position as a student, uh, especially if the administration doesn't get what you're trying to do. And so uh, student organizing is critical. Uh, finding faculty members, administrators who are on your side. Uh, there, there are some, you'll find somebody, you know, even if the most don't, uh, don't want to go along with it. Finding a strong voice in the administration uh, and faculty is important and uh, making a strong case. Uh, I know in law schools, for example, uh, law students coming together and meeting with the dean and making, a, a, you know, like a legal argument <laughs> can be effective. Um, but the key is organizing and building support at multiple levels among students, among administrators, among um, faculty. Uh, and it can happen. I, I've seen uh, so just in the last year, I, partly because of the uprisings of 2020 when there was a lot of interest, it's dissipating now, but a lot of interest in administrations uh, to do more anti-racist uh, work on campus, there was a momentary opening for more organizing around curricular change. And uh, at Penn, in my sociology department, we formed a Black Lives Matter committee that the grad students demanded. I co-directed uh, that uh, with another faculty member, but we also made one of the grad students uh, also co-chair of the committee. Um, at Penn Medical School, uh, I've worked with students who have, we, we wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about the need for curricular change. You know, published in one of the most prestigious journals and it caused a little bit of problems. <laughs> but, um, but it's making a change. Those are just a few examples. Um, and uh, students can, be a really powerful voice with the right support and organizing. Uh, so I, I want to encourage yeah. whoever asked that question, uh, keep at it. it, it 
it can make it, uh, it will make a difference. Great. Thank you. We're going to have uh, Kelly come up, but first, let's give a round of applause oh, to Dorothy Roberts you. for Thanks speaking so with us today. Thank this is wonderful. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Roberts and Eleanor, for your conversation on these urgent intersecting issues. Let's just show our gratitude one more time for them for being here with us tonight. So I'm Kelly Johnson, I'm the program director here at the Rothko Chapel. We'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, for this year's Farenthold Lecture. Um, Dorothy is headed off stage, she is going to uh, be outside across the street at our visitor welcome house uh, for a book signing, so we invite you all to join her over there. We do have limited copies for sale of her latest publication, Torn Apart, which you can purchase and get signed. We do hope to see you back at the chapel here again soon uh, during our open hours, Tuesday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., or for our upcoming programs, including our 2023 Oscar Romero Award Ceremony, which will take place on Sunday, March 26, in person or live stream, uh, honoring grassroots activists organizing around civil rights issues here in Texas and beyond. You can visit our website at rathgochapel.org to learn more and register for all events this season. So thanks again for joining us here in Houston, in Austin virtually, and beyond, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.